Assalamu alaikum everyone. Today we're very fortunate to have a, an eminent speaker who will be speaking to us about lives and livelihoods, impact of Brexit, foreign affairs and COVID-19. We'll have a conversation about that um, starting very soon. But before we have our talk, we'd like to start our program with the recitation of Quran. Let's start with Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل أتى على الإنسان حين من الدهر لم يكن شيئا مذكورا إنا خلقنا الإنسان من نطفة أمشاج نبتليه فجعلناه سميعا بصيرا إنا هديناه السبيل إما شاكرا وإما كفورا إنا أعتدنا للكافرين سلاسل وأغلالا وسعيرا إن الأبرار يشربون من كأس كان مزاجها كافورا عينا يشرب بها عباد الله يفجرونها تفجيرا يوفون بالنذر ويخافون يوما كان شره مستطيرا ويطعمون الطعام على حبه مسكينا ويتيما وأسيرا إنما نطعمكم لوجه الله لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا إنا نخاف من ربنا يوما عبوسا قمطريرا فوقاهم الله شر ذلك اليوم ولقاهم نضرة وسرورا وجزاهم بما صبروا جنة وحريرا متكئين فيها على الأرائك لا يرون فيها شمسا ولا زمهريرا ودانية عليهم ظلالها وذللت قطوفها تذليلا ويطاف عليهم بآنية من فضة وأكواب كانت قوارير قوارير من فضة قدرها تقديرا ويسقون فيها كأسا كان مزاجها زنجبيلا عينا فيها تسمى سلسبيلا ويطوف عليهم ولدان مخلدون إذا رأيتهم حسبتهم لؤلؤا منثورا وإذا رأيتهم رأيت ثم رأيت نعيما وملكا كبيرا عاليهم ثياب سندس خضر وإستبرق وحلوا أساور من فضة وسقاهم ربهم شرابا طهورا إن هذا كان لكم جزاء وكان سعيكم مشكورا إنا نحن نزلنا عليك القرآن تنزيلا فاصبر لحكم ربك ولا تطع منهم آثما أو كفورا واذكر اسم ربك بكرة وأصيلا ومن الليل فاسجد له وسبح ليلا طويلا إن إن هؤلاء يحبون العاجلة ويذرون وراءهم يوما ثقيلا نحن خلقناهم وشددنا أسرهم وإذا شئنا بدلنا أمثالهم تبديلا إن هذه تذكرة فمن شاء اتخذ إلى ربه سبيلا وما تشاءون إلا أن يشاء الله إن الله كان عليما حكيما يدخل من يشاء في رحمته والظالمين أعد لهم عذابا أليما صدق الله العلي العظيم for recitation. Um, today we're going to have a slightly different format to our normal. We're going to have a conversation, a conversation between me and um, Muhammad al -Marsi. Muhammad al -Marsi is the chairman of the Marsi Foundation, which supports initiatives in education, building cohesive societies, inclusive capitalism, governance, and the futures agenda. Uh, the foundation's also launched the Inclusive Ventures Group, a responsible profit social impact investing platform that is invested in education, livelihood, health, and waste management in Africa and Asia. Muhammad is a fellow of Brazenose College, University of Oxford, and is a member of the Development Board of the British Academy, and a member of a number of different boards across the globe. Um, he is also a trustee of Prince's Trust International and the Rose Castle Foundation. And today we're going to have a, a conversation about lives and livelihoods, the impact of Brexit, foreign affairs, and COVID-19. Um, clearly quite a lot to cover uh, in this very short period of time over the next um, half an hour. So we're really looking forward to this discussion today. Um, 
Well, let's let's start with um, Brexit. I mean, right now uh, we obviously have a, a, an impending situation where, in the next couple of months, um, we're in. A, we may have uh, a situation where we have no deal with the European Union, our, our largest trading partner up till now. What? How do you see uh, where we are currently when it comes to Brexit? So, thank you very much, McNair. It's a pleasure to be here and to be talking to your members. Um, the question uh, on Brexit is a very imp- interesting one. Um, I, um, for my sins, was a Brexiteer, uh, but a soft Brexiteer. I was of the Theresa May mold, which is to say that um, we should leave Europe, but we should not leave Europe on the most difficult and hard terms that is now being foreseen. And my reason for taking that stance was that We and Europe need each other. Um, We are their biggest trading partner um, and we are now joined to them. So uh, Europe, uh, EU and UK has an interesting history. I remember when I was barely 22 years old um, in chambers at one brick court, um, that was when the law of the EEC was being studied by all of us. Uh, As you know, we joined Europe in 72. 57 was when the Treaty of Rome took place. It was a Franco-German experiment. And when we joined, we thought we were joining an economic union. But what has since happened is that it has become slowly more of a political union in, in that they would like to create a United States of Europe. So that is something that we never signed up for in 72. And it's something that has been bothering us because slowly but surely our sovereignty is being um, eroded. So you now have a conservative government that um, won the referendum and then Boris won a huge majority. And uh, obviously he has a mandate to get us out of Europe and that date is set as the 31st of December, whatever happens. It's my view that we will get out by the 31st of December but I still believe that we will get out with an agreement, although it will be a flimsy agreement. It will not be a full-blown treaty um, that we wanted to have. And if between now and December, we can get away with a Canadian-style agreement, then I think that will be a great outcome for us because in the Canadian-style agreement, what you have is that 98% of goods are Um, not subject to any quarters and are subject to either zero or very little tariffs. So that would be great. If we cannot do that, then they say that the fallback is the Australia style deal. But in reality, I think it's more like the Afghanistan style deal rather than the Australia side deal, because Australia still has a number of agreements with the EU, including sharing of passport information when you cross borders, and some sort of um, policy on compliance alignment. If we were to leave without a deal or the flimsiest of deals, I'm not even sure we would have that. But it's in the interest of both parties. There is brinkmanship involved here. So I believe that we will have a deal. If it was not for COVID-19, I would be very optimistic um, as to the outcome of this uh, of, of the future of this country. But with recession, with COVID-19, Um, And with a Biden White House, a possible Biden White House, I think that we will have some challenges um, going forward. And what do you think uh, about some of the most important industries that we have here in the UK? Um, Some of the biggest uh, tax earners for our country are things like our our export, our services, for example. Uh, Do you think the Canada style, uh, a Canada style deal, if we were were able to achieve that, and that seems to still be quite an optimistic achievement, um, despite it being significantly less um, than what what most people thought at the time of the initial referendum. I think even people like Daniel Hanan and others who now are talking in, in these terms were saying there's no chances of us even leaving the single market. Now we're going down a route which is obviously significantly less, the Canada style deal being uh, far less in, in every single way. So, so how, do you think the, the Canada style deal could really be sufficient? I mean, or a lot of our um, divergence when it comes to uh, regulation. And in reality, we, we drafted most of this regulation that, that everyone else is following um, in a situation where we theoretically want to diverge, but actually we probably won't uh, or not materially. 
do you think that uh, the value and the sovereignty that, that is returned to us by us having the option of us um, diverging really is worth this risk of us not being able to, to have equivalence in, in many of these different industries and having to have all this extra paperwork and um, lorries lined up all in, 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 in Dover, etc. What, what do you think about these types of risks? So you have um, asked many questions rolled up yes. into a single question. So let me try and break them up. So firstly, let's look at services. I think that the UK's position as a major service provider to the world, I'm sure will continue to stay because the answer there is what's the alternative? So if you look at financial services, New York and London have been the financial centers of the world. It's not easy for that to be uprooted from London and taken to say Paris or Berlin or Frankfurt, which would be the other candidates that would be very happy, or Luxembourg. But they are very small. Language would be a problem. It's not so easy for people to live there. And then, um, you know, uh, English language, English law, basically governs so much of international trade and so much of financial transactions all over the world. So yes, there will be some sort of migration to Paris, more so Paris than I think Luxembourg or, or, or Frankfurt. But in the end, I think that will stay. I think on the legal services side, it's slightly more complicated because it's not clear as of yet now that uh, English law firms will have the ability to be able to run their offices um, in the way that they've been doing that on continental Europe and vice versa. So that I think, I mean, nobody really has focused on it because there are other bigger fish to fry. But I think that um, that will suffer in the beginning. But ultimately, I'm sure that they will find a modus vivendi where um, everything will be will be will be fine. On the rules, that's a very difficult but interesting question. So the argument has been that we do not want to be um, rule takers. We do not want, as it were, Brussels or um, Luxembourg, the Court of Justice, to be able to set rules which are then uh, uh, obligatory on us to, uh, to follow. So I think that they will be cherry picking to some degree on both sides, where things like the Euro European Convention on Human Rights and other rules which we think um, also meet our moral, legal, cultural standards, we are more likely to follow uh, than not. I think that's the status quo as it is now, because we draft them, as you say, we know what they say, and we are generally comfortable with them. The difficulty arises where we are now not sitting in European Parliament. They could pass legislation there, which would not be something where we have had any input on. And then for them to be able to impose that on us unilaterally is where I think we would take issue. So as long as the principles are uh, accepted, um, that whatever they do, whatever we do, are aligned to a large degree, then I think that that should work. Um, if let's, obviously... Let's ask sorry, exactly on that. I mean, we, we just talked about financial services, legal services and others. I mean, we know very much that Paris seems to not like London very much. Um, and uh, there is this, uh, some people would argue, uh, almost jealousy to some extent of the London financial system. And people want, have, have tried for a long time to try and take that away. Do you not think that now there will be this opportunity for uh, legislators in Brussels to, to impose legislation like a financial transaction tax or whatever, which, which we would have vetoed had we been or, or prevented happening had we been on the table, uh, which now will, will take precedence and, and, and will happen. And if that does happen, we will be taxed to make sure that, that anything that we do or anything that's, that's denominated in euros or, or that's linked, that has to be worked in, in Europe, in the EU, would, would therefore be under those, that law, which probably wouldn't have happened had we been in there in the first place. So um, I think the, the question of Paris wanting to be the financial center or Berlin now the venture capital center or Luxembourg, the um, hub for um, asset management, those have been talked on for us. As, as long as I've been in this industry, I've seen those sort of things happening. At the end of the day, I think you have to understand, I think that most of the uh, large businesses are fairly globalized in their operations. So it's not really in their interest to see that there is a tax that has to be paid should they decide to raise money in the London market, which by far is the biggest market. It has the biggest um, 
banks, it has the biggest uh, stock market, it has the biggest lawyers, it has the biggest of everything here. So if they were to, if, if their governments were to start to impose a tax on them, should they use London, then in a way that's going to negatively impact them. So I think there is a bit of bravado in all of this. Um, it's brinkmanship. And at the end of the day, I think business will continue um, as normal. There will be some early days when people will not quite understand where, but ultimately I think that they need us and obviously we need them. So let's, let's, do, let's move this on slightly. Um, we, when it comes to the European Union, um, the, one of the challenges that you said is sovereignty and this idea uh, of a political state. Some people were talking about the, there being a unified foreign policy, an EU army. I don't think many of these things uh, were that far along in the process, but they were being talked about at least. Um, but so let's talk a little bit about the sort of foreign policy in this way. I mean, uh, some people within many Muslim communities actually in the UK were quite concerned about uh, Europe and voted against, uh, voted for Brexit in part due to foreign policy or to, to this idea that Muslims in Europe are being treated negatively. And we've seen quite recently these discussions about how Pakistan has acted in, in quite a strong way to what's happened in France. How do you see how um, countries in, in, let's say, for example, in, in Pakistan for, uh, or Iran right now, um, they've acted quite strongly when it comes to France, obviously after the devastating um, murder of uh, the gruesome murder in, 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 in France and the, the subsequent issues that, that have happened and what, what Emmanuel Macron, the Prime Minister, has said. There's been a lot of, of clashes between these different countries. How do you see this playing out? So again, um, you, you ask many questions uh, rolled up into one, uh, but let's dissect them. Um, so I think that foreign policy um, has become, under the Trump uh, administration, very much transactional. There is no such thing as uh, alliances that are universal and perpetual. Instead, it's become transactional. So look at the case of the UK uh, and, and how it's had to navigate between the US and Europe. So on things like Huawei, it decided to side eventually after a lot of pressure by the US with the US. On um, situations such as the JCPOA, Iran, the climate change, as well as the move of the um, US embassy and the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, there UK decided that it would continue to side with the EU. So I think that in a lot of these things, each country, each region is going to look at what's in it in its own interests and not just blindly tie itself up to um, another power. Uh, you, you, talk, you talked about the European army. I think that after the way in which Trump has treated NATO, um, and I think he's quite right on one or two of the issues where he is saying, look, if you need us to defend you, then you need to pay for that defense. And if that continues, uh, and if Europe feels that in a way, either Trump or Biden have sort of um, uh, lessened their uh, alliance with Europe and are looking to forge partnerships elsewhere, then I think Europe will have no choice but to develop its own um, defense policy. So going forward, um, if I look at the US, I think the US at the, the time of Obama had slowly started to remove itself from the role of a global policeman. Uh, because they say, what's in it for us? And slowly that has meant withdrawing from the Middle East, withdrawing from Afghanistan, withdrawing from South Korea. The US is blessed in many ways because it has two oceans on each side, and then it has a friendly border up north and a very friendly border down in the south. So they don't feel threatened at all. So whatever they are doing with the rest of the world, they're doing it as a favor. And I think increasingly they are beginning to realize that it's America first that matters um, and, and nothing else. Um, whether it's America first and America alone, um, it's the nuance that people in the administration have sort of uh, come out with in order to soften Trump's position. Um, to your question about uh, Islam and Muslims, so I think that's a very difficult one. And at the end of the day, it's a question that I would pose to you. And I say, look, if I was to ask you, and you may have heard this from me before, that if you need to prioritize between your nationality, your faith, and your color, and you can't say that it's all important, you need to have one and two and three, 
That's a very hard question. So if you generally ask a Muslim, he might say that my faith matters more to me than my nationality or my color. If you ask other people, they will say that my color matters to me more than my faith or my nationality. And if you ask another type of people, they will say my nationality means everything. So it's a question of how do you really balance this equation? And in a country like France, like the UK, um, first and foremost, I think it's important to uh, understand that we are nationals of the country. We have their passport, so we need to basically follow the law of the land. The problem arises where that law manifestly conflicts with um, faith principles, whichever faith they may be. And then how to reconcile this in a way that does not upset the apple cart, does not upset majority rule, because that's the only basis of democracy that we know, is a fine uh, balancing act. And I think that um, in France, um, they have a bigger problem than us because they have not been able to integrate their Muslim population perhaps as well as we may have been here. And you know this far better than me with your role with the Muslim Council of Britain. But just as an observer, I feel that we have done that marginally better here than we have in France or Norway or Sweden or Holland especially. Um, and so what you see now in France is you know, President Macron um, coming out openly and saying that this is uh, completely against our constitution. This is against the ideas of the Republic. The freedom of expression has to be ab above everything else. Um, and then there are people who say that, look, um, you know, if you joke about um, color, you are seen to be racist. If you um, joke about uh, uh, Jewish people, then you are said to be an anti-Semite. But if you, um, you know, joke about the Muslim people, then that's supposed to be freedom of speech. So clearly there is a hypocrisy there, which they need to figure out on how to overcome, because you cannot have it both ways. You cannot say that it's freedom of speech when somebody jokes about Islam and the prophet and all that. And yet um, elsewhere, yeah, it is a crime uh, to to make anti-Semitic remarks, and we've just seen what happened to um, the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn here. Uh, so I think it's a question of France getting it right, and then if the world does nothing about this, then it will be seen slowly to be an accepted way of behaviour, and then more and more countries will follow France. So in a way, what Pakistan has done, what Turkey has done, more so than Pakistan, what Malaysia has done, um, has been to um, uh, assert basically that this will not be accepted nor acceptable going forward. And they have to recognize that this is a red line. Sadly, uh, we do not see this sort of uh, position coming out from a lot of the uh, pure Islamic countries of the Gulf um, because they've got um, other issues that they are sort of focused on. And so they have remained um, silent. Uh, and it's a pity that that has happened in many ways. And do you think many of these countries that we've talked about uh, across the Muslim world, um, uh, if you can call it that, uh, are, are acting in the interests of their people, the interests of themselves? So, you know, uh, as is my norm, I'll ask lots of questions embedded in one. Like you see in Pakistan the, the how... Uh, how Kashmir is being um, acted upon by the Pakistani government. You see in the Gulf how Saudi Arabia and UAE have, and Bahrain, sorry, more Bahrain and UAE have, ha and Sudan have uh, reached out to Israel when their populations have, uh, uh, all the popular uh, opinion polls suggest that they're not uh, in favor of this, but the, 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 the uh, leaders have chosen to go down that route. Uh, in, in, in what way do you think? Many people, when they talk about foreign policy, you talk about real politik, you talk about uh, interests, you talk about the fact that, as you mentioned just earlier, in America, you know, there might be nuance, but as a whole, it's America first doctrine, which is gaining much more um, uh, attraction there. In, in, in many places in the Muslim world, do you see a, an overarching theme where, where, where people put Muslims first, their nation first, uh, themselves first? Uh, or, or is it, or is it actually thinking of their people first, or, or is it actually very, very different in different places? And, and what's driving all these very, very different acts across different countries in the in the Muslim world? So um, let's start with Kashmir first. Um, that's something which is very interesting. So as you know, uh, India decided to revoke Article three seventy of their constitution, 
and therefore decided to annex um, uh, at least the Indian part of Kashmir, which still has a Muslim population. I think that you will find that Pakistan obviously spent a year objecting to that at the UN in speeches, but none of that got them anywhere as of now. And so Pakistan has now embarked, I think, on a strategy that is quite interesting if you analyze it. So I'm told by friends um, that they will announce, if they haven't already announced, the annexation of uh, what the area which used to be called the northern area, but is now being relabeled Gilgit Baltistan. So that's going to be annexed and it will become the fifth province of Pakistan. And six months after that, they will also annex another area of Kashmir, which is known as Azad uh, Jammu Kashmir, which will then become the sixth province of, uh, of Kashmir, uh, of Pakistan. So when you think about that, the Kashmir issue has been resolved, if I can call it that, but not in favor of the Kashmiri people who wanted an autonomous state. Half of Kashmir has been taken by India. The other half has been taken by, uh, by Pakistan. And it is the people in the middle uh, that uh, have suffered. That the same applies to Palestine, and I'll come to that in a minute. So um, uh, if you look at the populations, so in uh, Indian Kashmir, there is suggestions that India will uh, carry out some sort of ethnic cleansing because that part of Pak uh, Kashmir is, India is very, very beautiful, has great potential for tourism, but in a way it has not developed its uh, full potential as it should have. So the Indians have got major plans of putting money there, Indian businesses, Indian people. And in the course of that, either they will ensure that the livelihoods of the Muslims that have not really fared so well there. I was there three, four years back and I saw uh, what they were living under. They haven't prospered. So if India decides that they want to also uplift that population, then I think it will be a good thing. But if they decide to revoke the nationality of the Muslims there just because they are Muslims or to give them jobs that are suboptimal, then I think that that will be um, a bad thing. Turning now to your question of um, the Middle East, um, I think that uh, sadly, um, we, the Muslims, have allowed ourselves to be broken up into um, the Shia Sunni uh, rivalry. Um, until, say, 30, 40 years ago, um, the debate between Kaumia and Wataniya was very different. People were focused much more on Wataniya than on Kaumia. Now the focus is more on Kaumia than on Wataniya. So they look at your tribes, they look at your origins. If you are a Shia, then you are not a Muslim for some people. And obviously, if you're a Sunni, you are not. Uh, and this has suited a number of foreign powers very, very well, because it's the classic divide and conquer strategy. It's the classic reason for selling lots of arms, making a lot of money in selling arms, and then leaving the Muslims to continue fighting the Muslims. So if you look at the endless wars that the United States is involved in, Iraq is one, Afghanistan is another, uh, possibly Syria will be one where Russia, uh, America, um, and Iran will continue fighting there forever. Lebanon is uh, progressing into that sort of space. And so in a way, I think that we have to blame ourselves far more than the foreign powers because we have allowed for this to persist. Where else in the world do you find Christians fighting each other in this way or Hindus fighting each other or Buddhists fighting each other? It's only us. Uh, and so in a way, you know, it's it's we who have to blame and we are lacking leadership that can go above all this and unite uh, everyone and say, what are we doing this for? So, uh, I think that this may happen uh, slowly because with the US disengagement, and that will be followed by most Western disengagement, there will be a vacuum. Perhaps the Russians will start to fill it. The Chinese will start to fill it. But they are there for different reasons. They're not there like the US were there. So I think that that will then mean that countries will have no choice but to knock their heads together and come up with a way to live as neighbors. And how do you see this, the, the relationship between many of the Gulf countries and their approach to Israel more recently? Um, we've obviously seen how um, UAE and uh, Bahrain have, have opened their doors um, and, and 
begun or continued depending on how you see it normalization and sudan seems to almost have been uh told that if it chooses to pay a few hundred million dollars uh, and, and give normalization, it will be taken off the terrorism list. So that seems to have been at least uh, happening at the same time, whether some would argue a bully tactic, some would argue it just happens to be coincidence. But how do you see um, the normalization taking place within these three countries compared to its, um, in terms of the, the leadership making a choice versus its, the, the people's views. And how do you see that happening across the rest of the Muslim world? So, um, you know, when the uh, Abraham Accords were signed, it was trumped as this is the deal that has changed the region or will change the region. I say a little different. I say that the region had already changed and the deal was reflecting that change. So um, I'm very familiar with a number of Gulf states having worked there, lived there and all that. And um, there was, first of all, no war between UAE and Israel. So to say that peace has been made, I think, is a misnomer because they were not at war. Um, and if you, and, um, I think that it is well-known fact that Israel was supporting uh, UAE in terms of its defense, in terms of its cybersecurity, and a number of areas. So the relationship was already pretty strong. All that has now happened is that it has formalized what, has, what was going on uh, in any event there. Uh, so nothing much has happened. And um, sadly, um, not, much, not enough attention was paid to this Palestinian situation in all this. So given, yes, that uh, there was some understanding that as a result of this deal, the, the, the annexation and expansion of settlements in the West Bank by Israel would be, uh, would be frozen, um, but that's just a suspension as opposed to a halt. So that is what the Palestinians got out of this. Um, and then, of course, uh, the UAE was expecting to be able to receive F-35 fighter planes. Uh, it was vetoed by Israel. Israel then, as of day before yesterday, have lifted that veto. The F-35 sales now may go ahead. I say may because I think there is a realization in, in the White House that in case if Trump was to lose, then Biden may not quickly sanction that. So uh, there was a rush to get it approved before. And I suspect that deep down there will be an understanding between the Israelis and the Emiratis that even though the F-35s would be supplied there, um, Israel will have... Uh, uh, control over how those F-35s are deployed, because the last thing they would want is to arm UAE and then have those planes turn against them. Um, as you know, Qatar also said that if UAE is going to get F-35s, we also want F-35s. And that puts the US administration in a bit of a dilemma because by far its largest Air Force base is in Qatar. And so if it supplies F-35s to the UAE, why would it not want to supply F-35s to Qatar um, as well? I think that this, this Abraham Accords has got legs. And I think that in the case of Saudi Arabia, we heard remarks from Prince Bandar, who is very influential about a couple of weeks back, where he's saying that the reason why not much has happened on the Israel-Palestine issue is because the Palestinian leadership is too much set in its old ways and it has to start thinking out of the box in order to make progress. In this context, it was good to see President Abbas two days ago announced a global international conference for Palestine in light of the Abraham Accords to see now what's the status of Israel-Palestine. And my worry is that if the Palestinians do not wake up and understand the reality of the ground to some degree, then ultimately, ultimately what could happen is that they will never have a state, no one state, no two state, and the West Bank becomes um, a province of Jordan and the Gaza becomes a province of Egypt, and the Gulf state throw $100 billion at it and to keep everybody happy, and that's the end of their dream. So that's the default scenario that worries me the most, uh, as could, if it could happen, unless people start to think out of the box and say, um, how, do we, how do we now do a one state or a two state? And as between one and two states, I'm just not sure what it is that the Palestinians really want. I suspect it's a two-state rather than a one-state. Um, but then how would they govern, you know, two different parts with, a, with Israel in the middle, 
um, not being allowed to have any armed forces restricted in so many ways. So it's a very, very challenging question. In the case of Sudan, um, it's an interesting uh, question there as well, because the deal that was done was we get you off the terror list, you pay, Sudan pays $350 million in compensation for the victims of the um, terrorism in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, amongst other things, as well as the USS Cole. And we will remove you off the list, but you also have to normalize with Israel. Clearly, its population is not happy with it. But when I look at it, um, when Jerusalem was recognized as the capital of Israel and the U.S. moved their embassy from Tel Aviv there, uh, there was talk of an intifada, all hell will break loose, blah, blah, blah. None of that happened. So at the end of the day, I'm not sure much will happen in Sudan because their the economic sanctions that the U.S. imposed on them hurt them a lot. And for them to be out of this pariah state uh, category and being brought into the international fold will mean far more to them um, than, um, than, than, what, than their people objecting. I think Saudi Arabia, if they decide to normalize with Israel, I think that is on the cards. It could happen. And if it does happen, then the rest of the GCC, Pakistan, and most of North Africa would have to follow. Do you, really, do you think that... Um popular opinion is irrelevant nowadays. I mean, um, the way the reason I say that is, you know, in, in Sudan, as you'll probably be aware, you know, close to 90% of the population will have very negative views when it comes to diplomatic recognition of Israel. I think I'm, I, I'm reading a, 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 an opinion poll here, which shows that basically across the Arab world, it's between 80 and 99% um, against uh, diplomatic recognition of Israel. Uh, Obviously, if that happened in the Western world and, and um, uh, leaders were, were acting ways entirely against the population, um, there would be a significant concern. Uh, when it comes to uh, acting against the views of the population, um, and, and not just a small majority, like this is, I'm talking about 80 to 95% in, in, in most of these polling, um, it seems to be okay from our perspective in the West, at least, um, to almost ignore popular opinion and democracy when it suits um, our interests. So, so interests come first, and as you said, um, interests come first uh, to hell with human rights and, 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 and democracy. Is, is, do you think that's, that's the reality of the world that we live in now? I think that, um, again, those numbers that you put out, 80, 90%, I personally feel I'm not an expert, but I feel maybe somewhat exaggerated um, but, so I have not seen any global strikes or global protest movements in Sudan or the UAE or um, Bahrain. Um, now, if there was significant opposition, and it's not really recognition, it's normalization more than recognition. Um, so if there was significant opposition to this, then people would come up in arms, just as they have done now in Belarus, to unseat the government there, citing um, you know fraudulent um, uh, elections. Um, may happen in Tanzania as well um, after Magufuli's uh, Magufuli's attempt to to win. So uh, there hasn't been that kind of opposition. At least I have not seen it. Now, if that sort of and and clearly when governments or leaders decide to take this bold step they must have a gauge of how their people are going to react. Um, and if they know that this is not going to work as it, has, as it may not immediately in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, I know for a fact in Pakistan, when I put the question to the deputy prime minister in, in a webinar three weeks ago, he said to me, our people are not ready for that. So we will not do it as of now, as of now. Um, and so, the, the, they, they gauge the mood of their people. Um, and they take a bold step like this only when they know that they've got enough cover um, and that this will not happen. The difficult one, either, I think, is Bahrain, where, by and large, opposition seems to have been silenced in so many respects. And so there is no real way for this opposition to announce their uh, opposition to this normalization. But in a place like Sudan, you know, protests were always known there under Omar Bashir, it could continue. So they haven't done that. UAE, it will not happen because I think that they already had deep relationships with uh, with Israel. So I don't think it's about people 
uh, people's voices not counting. People's voices are counting, but sadly, the world has changed, and 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 rules that used to apply in the 70s and 80s are very different now. And so, unless you're going to be able to adapt to where things stand today, take what is on offer, start to build from it, and see slowly if you can claw back some ground. If you're not going to be able to do that, you're going to lose more and more and more because it's it's unstoppable. Who's going to stop it? Might is right in the future or currently. Is that is that how you see it? Well, um, I'm a believer of right being might, but yes, you're right. Um, at least on the face of it, in some places, it feels that might is right um, and not right is might. Okay. Um, when, when it comes to the US in, in, in many of these uh, foreign policy discussions, um, you mentioned earlier that you believe that the American approach to the rest of the world, whether under Democratic or Republican um, leadership, to some extent is, is not as different as, as some people might make it out. I think that's, that's, that's how I, I'm characterizing it, and please correct me if, if that's not fair. Um, do you think that um, when it comes to the next government, if, if, if for example, uh, Biden wins, as the opinion polls seem to suggest, but who knows, depending on few, uh, many different issues, but assuming he were to win, do you think, um, specifically on Iran, um, do you think there will be a, a, a turn back to a, a situation where a form of the Iran deal might be able to, to help? And, and that is quite materially different in the foreign policy uh, rather than necessarily an interest uh, solely, you know, very similar as the rest of the things that you were, you were mentioning. So let me make two or three points. I'm quite close to the situation, so I speak from some sort of knowledge. Um, firstly, uh, opinion in Iran is divided whether they think that with a Trump administration they're likely to get a better outcome or with a Biden. And here is the, the pluses and minuses. So with a Biden win, um, I think Iran's opening position will be that we need to be compensated for the lost years of the unilateral U.S. sanctions. So compensate us for that. I don't think that in the U.S. there is any mood to compensate Iran for the lost years. So that will be stumbling block one. Then we will come to the JCPOA. And on the JCPOA, it may be version 2.0 where um, there will be, say, uh, a freeze by Iran on its enrichment uh, processes and in return for a lifting of some sanctions and the possibility for Iran to sell oil. Um, the uh, oil market now is not what it used to be. There is a huge supply. So if anything, Iran may get the chance to sell one or two million barrels somewhere um, uh, over and above what it is doing now to countries like China and Venezuela. And, but the revenues that it will collect from that will not be great. Iran, I do not believe, um, is going to engage in any other uh, aspects um, on, of, of what the U.S. might want, which is to rein in their foreign adventures in places like Syria, Lebanon, possibly Yemen, possibly Bahrain. Uh, and also, on the other hand, um, where uh, they are being told to curb their development of the ballistic missiles or teach other people how to make ballistic missiles. So they will say, if you want us to do that, you need to stop arms sales to Saudi Arabia, UAE, because we can't have a situation where we are handcuffed and all our neighbors are being armed to the hilt and they may decide to attack us one day, especially now in the context of the F-35 sales to the UAE. Um, so that's not going to be a very easy deal. On the other hand, if you look at Trump, Trump is a deal maker in many ways. Um, Trump has done quite a lot on foreign policy, but because of the way he articulates these things, people generally think that uh, he hasn't succeeded. If I run through things, he's managed to contain China. He's managed to build bridges with um, Russia. He got uh, ISIS under control. He got rid of Baghdadi. Um, he has done the Abraham Accords. He has stayed out of trouble in Libya and, in fact, coerced the parties, the warring factions in Libya to come to some sort of understanding. He has pressurized uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia to come to a ceasefire. So there are wins. But because the media is so against him, 
because his way of articulating his his successes are always on tweets and always about himself rather than the policy, people tend to misread it. I think his failures are Korea, but even there people might say that he took the bold step of engaging with the regime, um, which nobody had touched for years. And at least on Iran, I think if he were to win, the chances of a quick deal with Iran, I think I would not rule that out. Um, it will be, again, uh, more like a Korean-style five-page deal, but at least it will give Iran something, and it will make Trump feel that he is a peacemaker in the Middle East, Obama-style, and that, therefore, his name should definitely be uh, uh, for, you know, considered for a Nobel Peace Prize, which is what has uh, eluded him and what he really wants. Okay, and... Um... Uh, there have been a few questions just people have been asking about, you know, how do you envision that that f the future, and that, this is going back a little bit, uh, how do you envision the future for the Palestinian people? So you mentioned, you, you talked about how, you know, if, if nothing happens, um, Gaza might be annexed uh, by Egypt and West Bank by Jordan. You know, well, what do you think is, is the right thing to happen there? So I personally would suggest that they need their own state. And um, if their state is as part of a greater Israel, uh, then I can see that um, Israel will not be both democratic as well as Jewish. It can be either democratic or Jewish. And more, more, moreover, it will remain or it will want to remain uh, Jewish, so it will not be democratic which then means that you have an apartheid style state in which the Palestinians will not have, will have passports, but will have no right to vote and will be limited in their freedom, in their, uh, in their rights as a citizen of Israel. So in many respects, a two-state solution would be the best outcome for them, where they have uh, the West Bank uh, with its uh, capital, um, uh, as well as uh, the Gaza with its own capital, and then they find some way of being able to run those two um, provinces, not dissimilar to what happened when uh, India uh, and Pakistan were uh, given independence in India um, and, and the East of Pakistan was, before it became Bangladesh, it and West Pakistan were one state with India being in the middle. The challenge for them is to try to keep those two parts together uh, but if they can do that, I think that uh, that's the way forward because, you know, we've been involved as part of the uh, Inclusive Ventures platform of supporting a plat or supporting an initiative called Gaza Geeks, where you got um, some very, very clever technical techni technology people from Palestine who are involved in startups there. And these startups are funded by Israelis, are mentored by Israelis. So the future could be bright if they decide that, yes, this path to statehood will still be difficult, but they have to start somewhere. Okay, and um, do you think, uh, in terms of global issues, we've got a number of these global issues, do you think sectarianism, you've, you've said quite clearly that you think that, that, that it seems to be more often in, within you know, Muslims and perhaps other, other faiths, um, I think in Northern Ireland, they may have a slightly different view, or at least in, in, in there compared to that. But do, do you, what, what, what do you think is happening first in, in UAE? Uh, we see that, or, or in Bahrain, you see that Shia communities in particular seem to be under quite a lot of scrutiny. Um, uh, one of the questions asked, Shias, are Shias being disappeared in UAE? Um, in Bahrain, uh, many people will, will be aware of the, the sort of, uh, how the opposition have been sort of silenced in many ways. Uh, and, the, and because of their Shia uh, identity, uh, what what do you see as the uh, as when it comes to sectarianism? What, what's driving some of it? So I'm of the view that um, when politics interferes uh, with uh, uh, segments of um, Islamic society or any other society, that's when trouble begins. So unfortunately, the Shia-Sunni split has been politicized significantly so that now it's seen as a, as a rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia for the hegemony in the Middle East on the one hand. And then that is reflected in what is happening in Lebanon, in Bahrain, 
in Syria as well as in um, Yemen. If um, people really wanted to do a deal, um, it's a very easy deal to do between Israel, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, where Iran would say, in return for you, Saudi Arabia, not interfering in Lebanon, not interfering in um, in uh, Syria, we, Iran, will in return not interfere in Bahrain and not interfere in uh, Yemen. In both of these places, in all four places, the rights of the minorities have to be respected as if they were citizens and their rights cannot be trounced upon. Sadly, it is the politics now that drives sectarianism rather than uh, differences in theology between the Shia and uh, the Sunnis. So clearly, if you allow yourselves to be used as pawns in a political game, that's what happens. And unfortunately, um, we Muslims have allowed ourselves to do that. So until the politics are resolved, this sectarianism and the uh, and the violence will continue. So, so on the politics of all of this, do you think international law really matters? The reason I ask that is uh, we talked a little bit about Palestine, for example. Everyone will be aware of you know the, the right to return of, of Palestinians, of, of 242 on occupation. Or we do the settle the illegal occupation, the illegal um, the world's longest illegal occupation in in in, in the West Bank, um, the Jerusalem and the the the, the, the United Nations resolutions about the capital and all of these different elements are, are relatively well established when it comes to international law. Do you think that in in your in the way that you're speaking, obviously, the way that I am inferring from it, and, and correct me again if I'm wrong, is that real politique is what is what matters. Realism is what matters. Don't worry, you know, if you're able to get away with it, you'll get away with it. Might is right. I know that you, you we, we slightly discussed this before, but do you, is that really what you think is driving this? Does international law matter in no real sense anymore if you've got power? So, I mean, uh, let me uh, ask a, a question or put a question back. I'm the United States. I am by far the world's only superpower. I have got 750 bases around the world. My dollar is by far the strongest uh, currency in the world. My culture is by far the most adapted culture. Technologically, Silicon Valley is by far the single biggest technology driver of the world. I am in this position. Why should it be possible for the United Nations or other people like the Security Council veto powers to be able to oppose what I want? I am the power. I am the superpower. United Kingdom was the superpower for 180 years. Rome was the power. Athens was the power. The Persian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, those were all powerful people. And history suggests that if you have that sort of power, then you want to be able to ex exercise it and assert it. So I suspect that unless, you know, if you look at the UN 75 years on, there are many who say that it has succeeded. There are many more who say that it's outdated in the way because it was set up after the Second World War um, to deal with the geographies and the dynamics that prevailed at that time. And people who won the Second World War, US, UK, France, and Russia, and China, by and large, were the ones that became the Security Council P5. But the world has now changed. India is an emerging power. Brazil is an emerging power. Germany has far more economic and other strengths in Europe than it used to have. So the, 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 it's, it's, uh, the, it's ripe for reform. Um, and so the US position on all this is that we are being, we are being stopped from being able to uh, exercise the way we see things. And within that, um, clearly for them, certain things matter. And I think that eventually in the shakeup that we are going to be seeing, it will be a superpower, but I call it the rogue superpower. The rogue superpower means that it will be a superpower that will want to dictate its terms all over the world. And it will look after its alliances or friends of which there are, I think, only four or five. The UK is one, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and possibly Japan. Israel, I keep out of it because Israel is more controversial. But it's these five states that will be aligned with the US in the hip 
um, on the very, very big, uh, very big issues. So yes, might is right, but that's the only way that the world has been able to evolve over thousands of years. And this is a superpower and it has the right up to a point to be able to dictate and decide for everyone else as to what it should be like. And you can fight as much as you like at the UN. Uh, the UN is deadlocked. The UN is not able to do anything today at all and force any of its decisions for or against any country. It's very difficult. Thank you. So let's move on to another international issue, COVID. Um, that is a, 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 the international issue of the day. Um, how do you see what's happening right now um, impacting more long term? I mean, many of us have been talking about the short term impact right now, potentially a new lockdown in the UK people are talking about. Uh, we've seen in the we've seen in the States one of the largest um, death tolls across the globe. Um, and in the UK, proportion wise, it seems that the UK hasn't done particularly well in this crisis. Uh, in fact, more people seem to be dying here as a proportion, um, as a death rate compared to the rest of Europe uh, as a whole. Why do you think that, so I, I guess there are two big, two big questions. Do you think that the form of governance we have here in the UK uh, and the US makes it more likely that we have greater deaths? Is that the reason why we, we're doing so badly? And secondly, do you think there's a, a, a long-term risk here about a change in the economy and on the back of it? So I think one has to distinguish between uh, different states and their ability to be able to impose their will um, from the government down to its people. I think the culture of free-loving Western democracies as such is the question of either give me death or give me my freedom. Um, I do not want to be dictated to, I want to be able to decide whether I should or I shouldn't wear a mask whether or I should or I shouldn't social distance. And uh, this debate between lives and livelihoods is a very, very difficult one. So sadly, in countries like the UK, the US, uh, Brazil, up to a point India, that question is a very difficult one because people have to balance between lives and livelihoods. So we go all the way supporting lives um, look at our numbers and look at uh, what is what is happening to the population. And then when the economy looks really crushed, then we go the other way. So in a way, we are like a drunken person, you know, s s moving from side to side without actually knowing where we are going with this. I think the sooner our government here and the U.S. government come to terms with the fact that this disease is going to be with us. It's not going to disappear sometime soon and we will have to learn how to live with it. The moment we start to focus on how to balance the R number with the impact, the negative impact that lockdown has on livelihoods and on the economy and get that balance right, I think that we will come out of this. I'm not sure that, vac that vaccines will be an answer to our prayer. Um, I'm skeptical that there will be a vaccine that will come sometime soon. I'm skeptical as to whether it will be effective. I think that the virus has mutated already in its second wave and it's lethal in the way it is um, uh, spreading very fast. I think the death numbers will start to creep up again. And nine months on, um, we, we, see very, we, we know very little about this. Now, you can do draconian ways of dealing with it like the Chinese have done. Uh, or to large extent how Taiwan, how New Zealand, um, how Vietnam have dealt with this, where they basically, everybody is very compliant, they're wearing masks, they're allowing their phones to monitor where they are, who they meet with, who they see. They have stopped overseas people coming into their borders and they basically managed to contain it. But that also is not a full-time solution because the moment they start to open up their borders again, then the same problem will start. So it is enough for now, but it's not a long-term solution. Can I just ask on, on this? I noticed of, of the countries you mentioned, uh, Brazil, UK, US, India, another theme that you see from those countries also happens to be the, the hue of their government. I mean, um, 
you could argue quite clearly that you know Trump is quite on the right, Modi is very much on the right, Bolsonaro is very much on the right, and uh, Boris Johnson in many respects is very much on the right of, of the po political spectrum. Um, do you think that can play a role in terms of the choice of decisions and why there's there's a almost a, a, a less willingness to have stronger state action? In the, I mean, we I think the argument that you know, as the Western world is more, you know, willing to, 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 to have these discussions and, and that's right, to, to, to be freer. I mean, I, I don't know whether that would work when, it, when you look at Germany, France and the rest of Europe where, you know, men, free love, I mean, it's, it's not that, that they are any, any less free than, than, um, than, than India or Brazil, at least, uh, in, in any real respect. Do, do you think sometimes competency plays a role? Do you think right-wing governments play a role? I mean, do you think any of these other elements might be a bigger driver? So um, look at France. Uh, France today is in a worse state than Europe. It has gone into a second lockdown. Infection rates have been 60, 70,000, three times our number here in the UK. So France has had a very bad second wave. Um, Spain is in second wave lockdown uh, now. Germany, Merkel is starting to look into that as well. So it's not um, whether this is left or right. Um, so on the right wing, uh, by that I presume you mean that they are the ones who will choose livelihoods to lives and where they will ensure or they will insist that people's individual freedoms matter far more. Um, and uh, because typically a right wing government would have the ability to lay down very strong diktats um, as to what somebody should or shouldn't be doing. But that doesn't work as well. So Russia is on any account an autocratic state. It's a right-wing state. But look at Russia's numbers. They are terrible. Um, you know, uh, they haven't been any more and Russia can dictate whatever it wishes. So yes, it applies up to a point, but I don't think this distinction applies. I think that in the UK, and the US, there has been a fight between the scientists on the one hand, um, guiding the politicians. So we have a SAGE here, as you know, the scientific advisory group. Why don't we have an economic advisory group that also sits down next to SAGE and say that for every decision you take, this is the economic impact that that decision will have. So I think this government has failed in that regard in that it hasn't taken enough um, information and analysis from the economic side, enough information from the scientific side, marry the two together and map out a short-term, medium-term, long-term strategy on how to deal with this. It is reeling from one side to another side and it is reacting rather than proactively taking this initiative. Okay? Competency is a big driver here. Uh, I think we'll, we'll come to the final question. We have taken close to an hour now, almost uh, off this discussion. And I've taken in lots of the questions that have come in from YouTube, from chat and, and, and via WhatsApp. So it's great to see so, so activity, so, much, so many questions which I've tried to incorporate in this conversation. Um, I'd like to end with, do you think there's gonna be a change? Do you think COVID is a, is, is a facilitator for change or an instigator for change? Do you think long-term this is, Going to change the way we we act, we interact, we 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 engage with one another, or do you think that this is just a, a blip in the overall um, push of all, all the changes in our country that we live in? So the global financial crisis in two thousand and eight, when it happened, everybody thought that this is now a game changer and we will have to change. Sadly, not much changed. Fate has now given us, the only good thing of COVID-19 is fate has given a chance to us to have a look at the reset. People are talking about what the, not the new normal, but the next normal. And they call it the next normal because they see that a pandemic has happened. They see more of these pandemics coming because of the impact of climate change more than anything else. And they see the next normal. They talk about building back better. I say it's not building back. You do not want to go back to where you were. It's building forward better. That is the better phrase. So there are a number of lessons that I think all of us have learned here. Primarily governments have learned. If I look at the bailout strategy of governments, okay, why do you want to bail out companies without imposing some sort of conditions on the bailout? Why don't you insist that they improve their carbon footprint? Why don't you insist that they look at a more inclusive form of capitalism? 
Why don't you see that they look after their workforce better? Impose conditions before you give taxpayer money blind to these companies, okay? So that should happen. Is it happening? I'm not so sure. Why not look at building public power partnership, uh, public-private partnerships? Why not see how the benefit of technology can be for the good of everybody? So these sort of events are, in a way, a, an opportunity to reset. But that requires bold political leadership, bold business leadership for change to happen. I don't believe we have that, and I therefore think that we will again lose the opportunity to, to build forward better. Thank you very much. On that note, um, uh, actually quite a dire note about this government being not, not being a bold political leader, not being uh, a bold uh, economic and social leader. Actually, the opposite, it seems to be uh, quite a, quite a uh, strong um, line that, 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 that has been uh, shared today. But thank you so much for this conversation. We've covered a range of different topics. We've covered uh, foreign policy across the globe, COVID-19, uh, and, and obviously starting right at the beginning uh, on, on the issue of Brexit. Um, it was a, a real, real pleasure to have this conversation and um, obviously many people have engaged throughout um, the last hour and uh, it's really uh, very fortunate that we, we have to, 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 have you, to have you with us today. So thank you very much um, for your participation and for your, for your engagement today. No, oh, and I very much enjoyed speaking here, Mikdad. Thank you for your um, uh, sort of... Uh, questions and also the questions that came from the floor. I think they were very incisive, very difficult questions to be able to deal with and I've done my best and thank you very much. Thank you. And so just a, a note for everybody, um, day after tomorrow we have the Milad and Nabi program um, uh, from, uh, and the talk is by Dr. Amran Ali Kanjwani. Uh, the week, next Friday we have another talk on the Prophet, the ethics of Pro following the exemplar of mercy by Professor Sajjad Rizvi. And the week after we have racism in the public space by the famous Nels Abbey. Uh, so please do engage and continue with our talks that we have on a, a regular every Friday. Um, and we also have our our other programs throughout the week. Our th uh, on Sunday, we have our uh, Quran Tafsir program starting at 9 a.m. We have tuition programs um, continuing via Zoom, obviously not in person, um, every Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, and we have our Dua Kumel program every Thursday evening. So please do engage, involve, get involved. Uh, and if you would like to find out more about our programs, uh, go to sikkim.org.uk. So thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching, whether on YouTube, whether on Zoom or another platform. Uh, thank you for all the audience. And thank you again, uh, uh, Mohammed, for your, for your insightful talk and discussion today. Thank you all.